All right, so now we're going to turn to our panel on uh, election law, and um, we have a, a late-minute sub uh, of uh, the moderator uh, will be uh, my UCLA law colleague, uh, Joey Fishkin, and he will be uh, introducing the panel. And uh, take it away, Joey. Great. Great. Uh, so I'm um, obviously substituting here for, uh, for Ned Foley, which means I have far too much hair to make this work, uh, but I'll try to, to do my best. Um, we have uh, four terrific uh, law professors now here, do. now we do, <laughs> um, who I'm not going to introduce in any elaborate way. Uh, I'll just go briefly through and then we'll go in this order and I'll be strict about five minutes. Uh, on the first round, we have Michael Morley of Florida State, Rick Pildes of NYU, Bertral Ross of Virginia, and Chara torres Pelosi of Stetson and also the Brennan Center. And um, I would like us to try in this first round to all uh, address the question, what is the primary lesson um, about fair elections or about faith in the process that we can learn from the experience of 2020? And then the forward-looking half, uh, what are one or two things that need to be done to assure free and fair elections and acceptance of the results next time? So, uh, Michael, let's start us off. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. So when we think about the 2020 election, obviously over the course of today, we've talked about the, the role of social media, we've, ta we've talked about the role of various other factors. When we think about the role that the law played in the 2020 election and looking forward ways in which we can hopefully improve the law to avoid similar types of disasters, I'd like to build upon some of the comments that we've heard from previous speakers and suggest that when we think about a well-functioning election system, when we think about the types of laws that we'd like to have governing our election system, there's really three main, whether you want to call them requirements, factors, criteria that, that we should keep in mind. The first and most basic requirement for any election system is that you want to ensure access so all eligible voters have an opportunity to vote. And in this post-COVID world, I feel the need to add to vote safely right, without unduly jeopardizing their, their, their health, their, their, their personal safety. Secondly, right, another critically important factor I would suggest, we want to minimize to the extent possible the, uh, the opportunity for things such as confusion, mistakes, accidents, irregularities, and yes, the word we've heard a, a, a lot of talk about, fraud. And then finally, to, 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 it, more specifically to build on a theme we heard from the last panel, a third separate, yet I would suggest equally important part, so we've moved past law and order of the two parts, right? The third equally important part is the perception of fairness, right? It's not just enough for the system to be actually fair, it's also, particularly in a democratic society, independently important for the system to be perceived as fair, to promote public confidence in the integrity of the process, to promote public confidence in the accuracy of the process. And I think that there are some ways that we can achieve, or at least you know, pr pr attempt to promote, many of these goals simultaneously, right? There's lots of, op there's lots of policies we could debate where we have to talk, talk about the trade-offs between, between different facets of the electoral agenda. But throughout much of American history, these goals weren't seen as being in conflict with each other. If you look at some of the most important voting laws in American history, laws that unabashedly were about expanding voting voting rights, in particular, pr protecting the rights of African-American voters, marginalized communities, whether the Enforcement Act of 1870 during Reconstruction, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 itself, you know, more recently, the National Voter Registration Act, these are laws that contained provisions expanding access to voting, protecting access to voting, in some respects making it easier to vote, eliminating burdens to voting, and also had additional measures that were aimed at preventing fraud, particularly during Reconstruction, right, stuffing ballot boxes. Voter fraud was actually a method of disenfranchising African Americans to nullify the votes of legitimate African American voters through the, through the use of, of, of invalid votes. So through much of American history, the, these different aspects of well-functioning election laws weren't seen as being in tension with each other 
together, weren't at different ends of a political spectrum, but were instead, I'm looking at tripods, but were instead three legs of a tripod helping to, helping to maintain electoral systems. So in practical terms, what are the sorts of things that we could think about to, 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 to try to promote these goals? Most basically, right, having clear standards, having clear requirements established, having the rules of the process established in advance of the election, certainly in advance of electoral disputes, I think we saw Congress take a good step in that direction by passing reforms to the Electoral Count Act. I know a lot, a lot of people up here on the panel had criticized the Electoral Count Act. I, uh, I said, yes, some, some of our friends in the audience also played important roles in, in getting those amendments passed. I think there are still a few things they could do to further improve, improve the statute. But those, those types of measures, I think, are just simple, basic, good government approaches to alleviate, to avoiding unnecessary electoral disputes. Passing election emergency laws, passing statutes in advance of an actual emergency, whether a natural disaster, a pandemic, as it turns out, terrorist attacks, right? 9-11 happened on the day of a, 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 a New York state primaries. Having election emergency laws that empower officials in advance to take particular types of measures to address crises that could unexpectedly uh, attack the system can help preserve can help preserve faith and confidence in the system. Promoting transparency, Professor uh, Rebecca Green has written extensively on different ways of promoting transparency in the process to, in order in order to in order to help promote public confidence. Uh, more funding for the system. Most basically, if we have more funding, if we're able to afford more election officials, more polling places, more machines, better equipment, we'll be able to alleviate a lot of the problems facing the system. Having, uh, we've, we've heard before about more technical type requirements, right? Logic accuracy testing beforehand, that's already a, a fairly common uh, requirement. Post-election audits, paper trails. I'd encourage policy measures that focus on all three of these aspects of the system. And I think we have some good places to potentially start. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, and setting a strong example of sticking to our time. Thank you. Uh, and let's turn to Rick. Well, I wanted to first thank Rick Hazen for running the only conference I can remember being at that actually is running on time, which is why I was 30 seconds late getting up to the stage here, because I didn't actually believe we would start right on time. Um, so I, I think we have to accept that our elections now take place in a sea of pervasive distrust and existential politics. And election law itself, in my view, needs to adapt to this age of distrust and that means certain policies and practices that would be fine under normal circumstances, uh, but which are likely to be fastened on today in this age of distrust, uh, ought to maybe be reconsidered. So modest compromises in other values might have to be made in order to minimize the practices on which distrust feeds. And I'm gonna quickly offer four suggestions along these lines. And as you know, Bruce and Julia have already said, there are trade-offs involved here, to be sure. And what I'm suggesting is that we tilt a little bit more uh, of the trade-offs towards trying to, to minimize the practices on which distrust easily kind of feeds. So one of these is I think we need more consistent standards statewide on sensitive voting policy issues. Our election system is extraordinarily decentralized, even for national elections. Uh, I think there's something like 10,000 jurisdictions that administer elections. Different counties in the same state often have different policies and practices. We could live with some of the consequences of that when the system was not placed under a microscope as it was in Florida in 2000, uh, or when we are in an era of high distrust now in the process. We can't, we can't live with that as easily in this circumstances. Uh, when different counties have different policies on things like, for example, whether voters will be given notice and an opportunity to cure defective absentee ballots, uh, that is going to trigger, among some people, concerns that there's something unfair about the process, something suspicious, particularly if partisan al actors who are often elected to these various administrative positions uh, make choices on these matters that seem to favor the interests of their partisan um, allies. There are, of course, significant differences between you know, large counties and more rural counties, uh, including resources, and when there are compelling justifications for counties uh, adopting different stances, that's one thing, and we need to respect that, but I think we need to re-examine 
some of the past policies and practices to make sure there really are compelling reasons uh, that these issues should be left to the discretion of individual counties. In the voter registration area, when Congress passed the Help America Vote Act, uh, it forced the registration system up to the state level, away from the counties, and I think that was a very good development. Secondly, and this is something others have already alluded to, uh, in this climate, it's incredibly important that we get results out in as timely a way as possible. Um, last time we did this conference, as Rick noted earlier, one of the things we really stressed was the national media being able to get the message out that you have to wait and be patient. I agreed with that, but I also said at the time, I didn't think that would make much difference in the circles where distrust and suspicion are likely to arise. And, and I think, obviously, 2020 bore that out. We need to recognize that these long delays breed suspicion in this climate, even if there's no good reason for it. Um, and as Stephen said, you know, we need to face that reality, but we really haven't discussed that much concrete measures to do that. So um, the two obvious ones, our election official legislatures need to give election officials the authority to process absentee ballots much earlier than election day. And secondly, I think we really have to consider these policies that allow absentee ballots to come in after election day. A majority of states actually have election day as the deadline, but in a lot of the states where controversy arose, uh, the ballots could come in much later uh, than, than that. Um, and I think that that's a potential source of, of uh, problem here. Third thing is we need courts to actually clarify election rules much further in advance than late in the day in the middle of the election process. We have lots of doctrines, particularly in the federal courts, that give courts reasons to defer decision. Um, I think in the election context, that's a big mistake. We have a prime example of this right now with the independent state legislature case before the Supreme Court. There are now some procedural reasons they could avoid decision, perhaps. I think that would be a very big mistake. We need the court, whatever it does on this issue, it, we need a clear answer well in advance of the 2024 election cycle. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is, I think we ought to encourage more people to vote in person. We now have such expanded early voting opportunities in so many states. This doesn't mean voting on election day. Uh, and I, I have no problems with absentee voting. Um, you know, that it's, it's fine. But we know there are going to be more issues that absentee ballot uh, process generates, both in terms of uh, disputes over those ballots, voters making mistakes on those ballots. Uh, in 2020, it was understandable with the pandemic. Uh, that we had this massive level of absentee voting. It went down in 2022, but it's not where it was before. Um, I think encouraging voting in person would be a way of mitigating uh, some of the risks associated with, uh, with the absentee ballot process. Uh, so let me stop there. Great. Um, Bertrand. Thanks, Joey. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, UCLA. Thanks, all of you, for being here. I know it's late in the day. Um, the panels that have gone on before us have put forth you know, great ideas, interesting proposals. Everything that I wrote down to present to you all has been said. And rather than saying it again, I'm just going to take you on a thought journey that I've been thinking about over the past few weeks. And um, you could discard this because Charles will say something much more interesting, and so it will be lost to the abyss of history. <laughs> but one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, what if it's not about faith and confidence and trust in elections? What if it's really about faith and confidence and trust in each other? What if the faith and confidence and trust in elections is just a symptom of a broader, or the lack thereof, is a symptom of a broader disease that's our body politic? And the question that I've been thinking about puzzling over the past few weeks is can American democracy survive this latest culture war? Now, this is a war about values, right? Abortion, guns, marriage. But I think it's also a war about American identity. Um, a war about our identity as, uh, as a people, um, what, it is, what it is to be an American, who belongs to the polity, who should be in our elected bodies, who should be our elected leaders. And this um, implicates race, gender, sexual orientation, all other features of our identity um, that are core to us. And elections for some have become existential. Uh, as, as, as Rick has just mentioned, a win is an existential opportunity to define American identity according to um, their preferred terms, 
a loss is an existential threat to America that needs to be avoided at whatever cost. And I think that Charles brought up this um, um, when at ever, whatever cost or means justify the ends type policy, politics. And I do think that this view originates on the fringes and the extremes, but is given oxygen in the mainstream through the infotainment system and then further inflamed by elected leaders who feed into the narrative. And this for me describes Sarah Longwell's triangle of doom. And the critical question is how that tri triangle can be broken because the threat to American democracy will loom until it is. And I think the opportunity, the, oppor opportunity, uh, the opportune link to break is with voters. Because I'm not sure that there's a necessary incentives exist or that there's enough shame in the world to change the behavior of the media or elected officials. And we need to recognize that American democracy just does not serve everyone, or at least it's at the very least not perceived as serving everyone. And those whom it doesn't serve are ripe for recruitment by anti-democratic actors sowing distrust um, within the system um, about a system that doesn't serve those people well. Part of the fix is democracy um, that substantively serves those who are marginalized and disaffected in politics. I don't think that it's an accident that a democracy with such extreme inequality as exists in, in, in the United States is under tremendous pressure and threat. And so if we wanna think about sort of trust, we need to think about distrust of the system that exists. And that of course is a part of the, part of that is the mechanics of the systems and the law that surrounds it, but I think it's much deeper and much more fundamental. Well, on that sobering note, been a few. Uh, sure. uh, good afternoon. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy, and I work on campaign finance and corporate law. So I'm writing a book, and you have to suffer through the chapter that I am writing right now. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, it is about a political party that is in the red. And one of the leaders of the political party writes in his diary that he is worried that the whole party will go to pieces because they are so in debt. So what is a party to do when it is dead broke, uh, especially in a context where there are no contribution limits and there's very little transparency of money in politics? Well, I think the typical response is that you're going to ask the richest people in your society for money which is exactly what this political party did. They gathered people in a secret meeting. Um, you had leaders from industry. You had leaders from the political party. One of the political party leaders says to the crowd, private enterprise cannot be maintained in the age of democracy. He continues, we must first gain complete power if we want to crush the other side completely. And then he ended, now we stand before the last election. If the election does not decide that we are in power, the decision must be brought about by other means. And the leaders of industry heard this anti-democratic pitch and they responded by giving millions in dark money. And then suddenly my political party, which uh, was dead broke, was suddenly um, full of millions. Um, and it was the last free election for 15 years. Uh, this is a true story. Uh, some of the characters who were involved uh, included Gustav Krupp. Uh, he was the head of the Krupp Corporation. Uh, Frederick Flick, he was the head of the Flick Concern. Uh, Karl Crouch, he was the head of IG Farben. If you've never heard of IG Farben, you might have heard of one of their existing subsidiaries, which is Bayer. Um, and at the time, IG Farben made everything from bare aspirin to Zyklon B, the gas that was used in the gas chambers. And if you haven't figured it out yet, the party I'm talking about is the Nazi party. The political leader I was talking about was Hitler. And uh, the businessmen at that meeting end up charged with war crimes after World War II. Uh, there was the Krupp Tribunal, the IG Farben Tribunal, the Flick Tribunal. And how does this uh, translate, if at all, to our current context? It is breathtaking looking at Germany in 1933. At the beginning of 1933, they had a democracy. By the end of 1933, they had concentration camps. 
Now, I want to be clear that I'm not trying to equate any current American political party with the Nazis. But I do really worry when you have this confluence of power and greed intersecting. And so we could ask, do we have a dark money problem now? And I would say yes. And my uh, exhibit A is the man in the middle here, Sam Bankman Fried. This is a list of the biggest political spenders in the 2020 election as reported to the FEC. But I put a little asterisk by that number because I think it's inaccurate. And the reason why I think it's inaccurate is Sam Bankman Fried has been charged with um, not just securities fraud, but campaign finance crimes. And at first, uh, when he was charged, it was a little bit vague what they were charging him with, even for me. Uh, but in a superseding indictment that came out uh, last month, they made it a lot more clear. He is accused of making $100 million in illegal corporate campaign contributions, which is staggering. Uh, and you could ask, why is he doing this? Uh, according to DOJ, they think that he was doing this to curry favor with uh, incumbent politicians so that they would draft legislation that would be favorable to his companies. And indeed, he was shopping around a piece of uh, legislation before he was arrested. So what is my nightmare scenario? Uh, I think we clearly have an audience for anti-democratic ideas. Um, and I think we got lucky that only my pillow was funding it last time. What I fear is that the, na the next Sam Bankman-Fried will partner with a anti-democratic authoritarian, and then we're in real trouble. Uh, and that's why I, I think we need to solve the dark money problem, because if we're going to have accountability from consumers, investors, and voters, then you have to know what's going on. Thank you. Okay, well, this panel has taken a, a, uh, a turn from... <laughs> A dark turn, perhaps. A, a dark turn, a sort of progressively darker turn as we went down the line in an interesting way uh, to me. And so I'll, I'll sort of continue. We'll have a little discussion up here and then be thinking of your questions, which can occupy any point along the spectrum of the descent into the darkness that we've just <laughs> experienced. So I guess, um, you know, there's a, there's a uh, kind of overarching question that I've had in the back of my mind thinking about uh, about some of what several of you said, which which has to do with whether um, as we project from the uh, experience of what happened in 2020 uh, and 2021 into our worries about what might happen in 2024, the worry is, are we in some ways um, defending against or fighting the last war, are there particular things that might uh, go wrong differently uh, in 2024 that we really ought to be concerned about that are not just the same thing that went on last time? And I guess I'll, I'll leave it to any of you whether you want to uh, think about that question in general or specifically with reference to the Electoral Count Act that's been mentioned several times, which is a kind of narrow, fix, but a bipartisan law that somehow has passed that seems pretty clearly aimed at one particular kind of electoral subversion problem that we faced last time. Um, but, you know, does it really get at the uh, scenarios of how elections could take a really dark turn uh, that were the most worried about for, for the next time. So anyone who wants to. Well, I'll, I'll start it in on that if you don't mind. Great. So um, I don't agree with your characterization actually of that uh, reform as narrow. Um, it does a lot more things than I think most people realize. So one thing it does is, is re it requires states to resolve the election process and any disputes over the election process through laws that are enacted in advance of the election. And that takes away, to the extent it's effective, 
uh, a lot of potential sources of election uh, subversion. Um, it also deals with uh, the risk uh, that uh, Congress might want to overturn results in a state uh, based on second guessing the process that took place in the states for whatever reasons, claims of vote fraud, claims of bad court decisions, uh, by making it clear that Congress is to accept the results as determined by the certification processes in the states and by any court decisions that are involved uh, in the process, including um, if a governor, which is one of the things we worried about in advance of 2022, if a governor goes rogue and refuses to accept the certification through the state processes and tries to send Congress a different slate of electors, uh, it also makes clear that there's a role for the federal courts in that circumstance and that Congress is to accept the results uh, from the electors that have been sent in pursuant to the decisions of the federal court. So I, I think that act battens down a lot of hatches and a lot more than many people realize because it's technical, didn't get a lot of press, uh, it's hard to explain. One of the virtues of the process is that because it was so technical and complex, uh, members of the Senate and that bipartisan group were willing to take a lot of input uh, from election law experts. Um, and uh, the only thing to keep in mind, of course, is the statute is self-enforcing by Congress. It's unlikely a federal court would get involved to enforce the act against Congress. So at the end of the day, we're always you know, hostage, in a sense, to Congress accepting what it agreed to in this bipartisan fashion. But the fact that it had such deep bipartisan support, I forgot the exact number, but more than 70 votes in the Senate, you know, I think is a good sign that, at least in the Senate, uh, the act will hold. So I, I don't think it's right to minimize how consequential that reform uh, was. Uh, and, you know, it's the most significant national legislation on voting issues since, I mean, you could say 2000, but I think it's a lot more significant than HAVA. So you may have to go back to the early 1980s uh, for another piece of legislation as significant as this on voting rights in, the, in, in Congress. I mean, I'll just say something briefly. I, I agree with Rick in terms of the importance of this piece of legislation. I think that one of the things I worried about before the midterm elections was the amount of pressure that might be put on um, governors um, with respect to the certification of the results. Um, in particular, the worry was that if there were election deniers or uh, Trump acolytes that won um, in these critical states, I do. I did wonder whether um, how that pressure would play out, and even though there is a judicial um, stopgap um, that will, in a sense, you know, force the governors or force the state to um, produce the the right slate of electors, I did wonder if that process would break down at the state level. But I feel a little bit more confident about that breaking down about the state level and it holding up. Um, especially with respect to the results of that election. And once we get a, a presidential election under our belt, you know, there will be a precedent that's set with respect to how this Electoral Count Act will work going forward, which I think will be helpful. J jumping in along those lines, one, from a purely legal perspective, because there's a separate question that, that I think Rick alluded to is you could have all the law in the world, but if the, if the people who are ultimately in charge of enforcing it aren't going to, that then raises, in some sense, extra legal questions then about how do you, how do you how do you enforce those norms when the people enforce who are responsible for them won't. But at least within the within the realm of law, one of the one if you look at an election code, I think one of the most underspecified places in most jurisdictions that that I've seen anyway tends to be the rules governing canvassing. Right? If you look at an election code, it's typically hundreds of pages. You'll have dozens of pages about voter registration. You'll often have over 100 sections on the conduct of the election process itself, detailed rules, detailed regulations, and then at the very end, and then the results will be canvassed. Right? Maybe if you're lucky, you'll have two sections in, in, instead of one section. But a lot of state election codes just basically say there will be a county canvas, there will be a state canvas, any problems will be sorted out there, and that's it. Some jurisdictions, the most recent cases interpreting these are from like 80 years ago, 
And so to the extent that state legislatures are open to following the example at the federal level of just, you know, rather than you know, jockeying for advantage or doing something you know, for some sort of partisan outcome, just to have basic, very boring, very technical, good government type improvements to stave off unnecessary problems and reduce the, right, reduce the opportunity for the sorts of things uh, you know, Birchall was justifiably worried about could happen in the 2022 election, fix the canvassing laws. Detail in particular what the powers of canvassers are, specifically the limits on their powers, the fact that they're not just able to ignore election results, throw out election results, have un baseless speculation uh, about what might have happened and therefore refuse to certify results. That, I think, is just a, a hole that consistently across, across jurisdictions we, we, we tend to see, whereas most of the rest of the code tends to be very, very thick and well specified. So if you're going 80 years back, I'll go 150 years back uh, and to the 14th Amendment. And I am encouraged by the result in New Mexico against Cui Griffin saying that he lost his ability to be in public office because of his participation in January 6th. And I hope that that precedent is applied not just to this teeny tiny commissioner in Otero, New Mexico, but it might be applied to uh, other candidates who are seeking office. Well, uh, I, I actually think that's a question that's worth opening up for all of us, because I think a distinct possibility, uh, at least if Sarah Longwell's sort of uh, gaming out from earlier that I thought was very illuminating is to be believed is that you know, there's a substantial possibility that former President Trump could be the nominee again, and uh, in which case, I think there will certainly be political, legal, uh, and various kinds of, of challenges on the basis of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to whether he can be a candidate. And I'm curious um, to hear from uh, any of you, uh, and Chara, feel free to come back in, but, but I, I'm interested in all of your views, of um, what we should think about those challenges, both legally and also politically and culturally, in our current divided, um, deeply distrustful context, and, and perhaps what our own role as, as scholars may be in, um, in guiding or explaining uh, what that is about and, and or how those challenges should be resolved? Well, at least so far, uh, these challenges have not worked against uh, sitting members of Congress, but I think it's possible that those cases were brought prematurely because no member of Congress has been found guilty of uh, participating in an insurrection. Uh, I feel like Trump is a different case uh, and that it, we, we're uh, overflowing with evidence uh, against him. And so I am hopeful that my faith in the legal system will be borne out. It, I, it, we'll see what happens next week. I mean, I'll, I'll just say there's there's been a, a debate uh, about whether that provision um, requires a congressional statute to be enacted to empower uh, U.S. attorneys to enforce it uh, for federal elections. Uh, when it was used uh, after the Civil War, Congress did pass a statute authorizing U.S. attorneys to bring prosecutions under that provision uh, based on people who had taken an oath to the United States and then violated that oath through you know, secession in the Confederacy. Um, so that's a, that's a long-standing historical debate, um, which is, has to be part of this discussion, at least from a, from a legal matter. I haven't looked into it deeply enough myself to have a convinced uh, view, but, um, but I know it's a very live uh, debate. There are also there are also separation of powers aspects to that. At least with the uh, there there had been attempts 
to try to exclude congressional candidates off, off of the ballot, and at least in the context of, of candidates for Congress, right, the Constitute, the, the uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment right, dis makes you ineligible, disqualifies you from office, right, Article 1 of the Constitution makes each chamber of Congress the judge of the election's qualifications and returns of its own members, and so there's a, in addition to, in addition to the question of whether it's a, it's a, it's a uh, self-executing amendment, there's a separate separation of powers issue of can a state uh, secretary of state, can a state election official, or can a federal or state court for that matter, at le again, at, at least in the context of a congressional candidate, keep them off the ballot on the grounds that they've been disqualified, or instead, does the Constitution give that authority to each chamber of, of Congress itself? And again, it's not something I've done a deep dive into, but it, it, it's, uh, it's a matter that's been, that's been debated. I, I mean, <laughs> one context in which you can imagine this arising, which is different from the one you raised, which is uh, suppose Donald Trump is the nominee and suppose these ballot challenges are made in the courts and they're rejected for one reason or another. There's not a federal statute or he hasn't been criminally convicted or whatever the reasons might be. Um, and he actually wins the election. And now uh, Democrats in the House or the Senate uh, want to object to the returns from a state that has voted for Donald Trump uh, on the grounds of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Um, I, I don't think it's, you know, inconceivable to imagine that scenario. Um, certainly be the such objections, yes. And so I, I think, um, I mean, we're ranging fairly far f afield right now uh, from mundane issues like consistent state policies on voting issues. Uh, but I wanted, I wanted to mention it because I do think it's, it's the kind of thing that we should be thinking about and, uh, uh, and what we think about a scenario like that. Right. And I, and I think that that post-election scenario, it, it seems unlikely um, that the court wouldn't want to take any part in that um, for institutional reasons, separation of powers reasons, among others, um, and whether a congressional objection and the challenge to the validity of the slate of electors for President Trump, whether that would hold up. Uh, I, I think post-election, it, it, it feels like it could be very much un under... Um, unfurl the fabric, or I can't think of the word, unfurl the fabric of our democracy in a way that would be quite destructive. And um, so I think that any challenges for them to be effective would have to be at the pre-election stage in terms of keeping him off the ballot. I just don't know if the legal processes with respect to indictment and conviction are going to um, proceed quickly enough such that um, challenges to him being on the ballot will be able to um, proceed. So I'd like to invite anyone who has some questions for this panel to make their way up. Um, and actually, I see a couple of you are already here, so um, go ahead. Oh. Uh, hi, uh, David Holtzman again. Yes, I am an advocate of ranked choice voting. Um, nothing to do with that. I think one of the things that may explain why uh, things went so well after the 2022 election compared to the after the 2020 election is because there was no presidential election on the ballot in 2022. So maybe one of the lessons from 2022 and 2020 is that only president matters. I mean, the presidential election has been pretty much uh, half of what I've been hearing today. So my question really is, you know, to what extent do you think that's true? That, you know, really only presidential elections matter in terms of uh, insurrections, violence, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what you would think of moving the presidential election to have its own standalone date? Um, I think you're wrong on the first premise, and I think the second would be a horrible idea. <laughs> so uh, on the first, um, one of the things that's been true about our system for a while, uh, and Francis Lee was the one who pointed this out most powerfully, is that control of each part of the national government is uh, up for grabs in almost every election cycle. And if partisan control of the House or partisan control of the Senate is perceived to be at stake, uh, I think you'll see very much the same kinds of things you might see with a presidential election. Maybe a slightly reduced temperature, but it would be, the stakes would be perceived as extremely high. Uh, and um, one of our problems in elections in general is getting people to turn out 
The presidential election is the most mobilizing election. We want other races to be on the ballot at the same time. You don't want tiny turnouts deciding important elections for other offices. So I think it would be a very bad idea to isolate the presidential election. I would just remind us that it's not the uh, Congress that we just elected that will be pivotal in counting votes, uh, electoral college votes in 2025. We have one more chance to get rid of election deniers. And if we reelect them in 2024, it's that Congress that it has to count the 2024 electoral uh, votes. So uh, I put it on all of us to do better uh, we can still save this, but I think we are still very much in peril. And with respect to sort of the effects of congressional elections, I'll just say um, briefly that one of the things that the presidential election has in terms of advantage in mobilizing people who um, are willing to deny the election and also to go at great lengths to make sure that the other person doesn't um, take office is that, you know, it's it's a national election by nature. And so the diffuse nature of congressional elections um, make it um, make them a much more difficult focal point um, for national mobilization, for violence, not to say that they cannot be, but these elections, um, for them to be that focal point, have to be um, nationalized in that, in that way. I think that what we saw in Arizona was an attempt to nationalize that election, but it never um, got the traction. Um, I don't have much doubt that the national election in 2024 with respect to the presidential race, um, I, I, I think it will be very able to gain the traction necessary. Good afternoon, Garrett Lutz, Citizens Oversight Projects. So, Listening to the story of Mr. Richer, I think it's absolutely unacceptable to have this type of intimidation on our election officials. And so here, this panel, you were talking about evolving election laws, which I think the states absolutely have to do to help support these election officials, the election process. What laws in specific, specifically have we seen or are we looking forward to rolling out, maybe throughout the country or in the vast majority of states, to help our election officials and help the processes and funding? I mean, I think, I think many of them have been discussed earlier today. And so, you know, part of why the ire is being directed at election officials is based on their sense that they um, have, you know, control over the system, they have the ability to operate the system, they have, in a sense, the, the funding necessary to do whatever is needed to make sure that the system works properly and that they're not doing that work. And so a lot of the proposals that have been put forth today is to, you know, give the election officials the means and the technology to transparently show that this election is operating according to um, the law and that they are, um, acting in a fair and neutral way to make sure that these ballots are being counted, whether it be um, being able to sort of trace election ballots to show that from the beginning to end it has been counted into the system, or whether it be um, the counting of election ballots more quickly so that there isn't a sense that there's something more nefarious going on. These are matters of election law um, with respect to legislators choosing when um, absentee ballots can be opened and counted, right, which tends to slow the process, um, and other aspects of election law that can be corrected at the state level. And so to the extent, and then there's some aspects that just require funding, right? Our election system um, operates poorly in some instances, and I say poorly in the sense that there are longer lines, it's just more difficult to get through the process than it should be because there's just not a lot of funding being um, targeted towards these elections. There's some that operate through the Health, Help, Help America Vote Act, but I think most people generally agree that more funding and resources to make the operation of elections run better um, would be a, a, valuable, a valuable contribution. I would add on the campaign finance front, I have no delusions that the split Congress will do anything with campaign finance, including uh, there is a rider that has been in the U.S. budget several cycles in a row now that prevents the Securities and Exchange Commission from promulgating a dark money rule for corporations. And I don't think that that rider is coming out anytime soon in a split Congress. But the good thing about federalism is each state 
can improve their campaign finance rules, uh, especially the states where you can put things on the ballot and voters can actually vote to improve their election system. So I'd encourage more of that as well. To, to build on some of the, of the previous answers, I mean, in, I think your question really implicates two separate issues, right? Funding and protection for election officials. In terms of funding, I think it's a pretty dramatic example that in the middle of a global pandemic, in the midst of an ongoing presidential election, right, Congress was willing to allocate $300 million in emergency funds for the electoral process, and it was private funding, right, Mark Zucker, yeah, the Mark Zuckerberg uh, the Foundation, that gave like 400 or 400 50 million dollars for uh, local jurisdictions in order to respond to the threats posed by COVID. So even, even right there, in the middle of extreme, right, of what, what I would very seriously classify as an election emergency, the, the federal government wasn't willing to, and I think the Brennan Center had estimated you actually needed $2 billion, uh, figure somewhere around there, in order to fully address all of, the, all of the needs in order to be able to safely conduct the election, make sure everybody had an opportunity to vote, you know, not die. And so, if you're not going to get adequate funding in those sorts of emergency circumstances, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical that it's realistic that we're going to get the sort of funding that I think would alleviate at least many of the problem, the, of many of the problems that we see. In terms of in terms of election official harassment, I mean, I think we were all horrified by those recordings that we heard, and that's the tip of the iceberg. And so, yes, I, I, I certainly think that there are, that yeah, to the extent that states provide additional protection, provide additional measures, or it's strengthened protections for election officials, that's obviously a good thing. But on the other hand, right, I mean, e even in the absence of increased protections for election officials, right, you still can't threaten people, right? Even if you're not an election people, there are still base laws in effect. And so I question whether the issue really is the need for more laws as opposed to a, a greater willingness to enforce existing laws to protect, to protect election officials. Because if you can, and everybody has, or many of the previous speakers have emphasized, right, most election officials they're your friends, they're your neighbors, right? They're retirees, they're, they're people doing this, right? Not to get rich out of public service. And so if they're gonna be harassed, if they're gonna be threatened like, like this, we're going to see the system fall apart. And so having that willingness to enforce the laws there are might be just as important, you know, if not more important, than, than getting new laws. I think there's someone over there. Yeah. Sure, go ahead, thank you. Thank you all for a really interesting panel. My, my name is Elizabeth Grossman, and I'm with Informing Democracy. We're a nonpartisan nonprofit that's building a, a library of the election processes after the ballots counted or after the ballots cast, so the counting and certification process. Um, and um, my, my question is about this this topic that came up of the trade-off between access and security. Um, in particular, because there's two kinds of security. There's actual security and there's sort of perceived security. Um, and there's good reason to value perceived security, right? We want people to have trust in election, and so and that matters a lot. Um, but I, I really want to drill down on what exactly we're talking about when we are talking about this trade-off. And, you know, when we start talking about eliminating drop boxes or having people vote more in person or, or moving up the mail by uh, deadline to election day so there's not a delay and, and it seems like a lot of that is, is about the perceived security rather than actual security because we don't have evidence of widespread fraud. And so, you know, is that outweighing the actual access issues that, as we know, disproportionately are impacting marginalized voters, voters of color, voters with disability, and, and how are we weighing that and how are we able to talk about that? So I'm glad you brought that up because that's definitely a, a significant viewpoint um, that's out there. Um, I guess I would say a few things about it. First of all, in this climate, we tend to think every one of these issues is itself of existential magnitude. So whether there's this policy or that policy, you know, everything's going to turn on that particular rule. Uh, and that's often not the case, so I'll just give you an example from the 2020 election. Uh, the most uh, high-level legal dispute in that election that went to the U.S. Supreme Court involved Wisconsin uh, and the lower federal court uh, there having extended the receipt deadline for absentee ballots by uh, three days or six days after election day. Uh, and the US, U.S. Supreme Court blocked that from going into effect. When that case was being litigated, uh, the district court 
had suggested as many as 100,000 ballots would come in after election day. And that figure then got repeated all the way up the court system and in a lot of the media commentary about the case, you know, there were even headlines, 100,000 voters in Wisconsin may be disenfranchised. Now, we often don't track these things down after the fact to actually see what happened, but in Wisconsin, you know, I actually did look into the data once it finally became available, and there were about 1,014 ballots that came in um, after that election uh, deadline. So, I mean, I think one thing to think about with respect to some of these issues um, is, you know, exactly how high the stakes actually are. The second point is, um, from the perspective of individual voters, you know, I understand the, the, the framework of we should do everything possible to maximize opportunities, uh, access. You know, yes, you may have three weeks of early voting, but you should also have access to no absentee voting, and you should be able to have that ballot come in 10 days after the election and the like. But as Bruce said, and I think, again, Julia kind of adverted to, there are trade-offs in designing a democratic system, and we need to think about um, not just that perspective, but the, the, the stability of the system under the circumstances in which we now exist. Uh, and I think there are some trade-offs uh, that are worth considering, you know, as all the election officials also tell you, you know, they want to be able to get results out quickly. Now, you can't have everything. In 2020, Florida uh, was able to re release the count of 98% of the ballots on election night. And there aren't really very compelling reasons that other states couldn't do similar things. There may be some issues in particular states that are all by mail or whatever. Um, and there weren't significant you know, issues about disenfranchisement, as far as I'm aware, you know, in Florida in the 2020 election. Um, so I, I think we have to face the reality that we are in this climate of incredible distrust where people believe the stakes are extremely high. And I think we need to make some accommodations to that reality, uh, even if it means you know, facing some difficult trade-offs uh, in, in how we design the, the process. Though, though I would add, Florida is not running under the 2020 rules anymore. And I think that is true of the majority of states. I guess I would say I, I do worry about that trade-off between access and perceived fraud because I do worry about the potential slippery slope of that because you could perceive fraud um, and from a variety of, of different sources that are quite unreliable and for which there's no actual basis of fraud at all. But I will say on the access side though, I think that um, what social science has shown is those things that we think give greater access or the things that we see as giving greater access actually have not really increased the participation of marginalized communities. And so if we're thinking about that trade-off, I think we have to think about that aspect as well. I think we sometimes make ourselves feel better by you know, providing absentee ballots and longer um, um, times to vote before elections and all of these measures of convenience voting as means of, of in increasing um, the number of voters and turnout, and particularly amongst marginalized communities, or at least that's the story I tell myself, but the story doesn't pl uh, play out when you look at the social science studies that suggest that convenience voting has a um, statist uh, statistically insignificant effect on turnout for marginalized communities. So I think that, you know, to the extent that we are we do care about the perception of fraud, and I, I do worry about that, but to the extent that that matters, we should really think about the trade-off in terms of things that really provide access um, to individuals and increase their turnout opportunities, rather than these access provisions that will not have the effect and will increase or will feed into the perception of fraud um, that we don't necessarily want to feed into anyways. Can I just add one more thought on that? I, I Think, I agree with what all the other panelists said. I think they raised a lot of a lot of other good points, but I do also think that if a legis and again, right, assuming as, as some legislature somewhere are willing to work in good faith on the issue, I do think that it's possible, at least in some circumstances, to promote multiple goals simultaneously. That they don't always necessarily have to be in conflict with each other, right? So, for for example, 
you, you might be able to consider something like automatic voter registration, right, under circumstances where there are checks in place, right, to confirm that the person actually you know, is, is a citizen or, or, is, or is eligible to vote or, or something like that, right? You could consider, right, a voter ID, something like a voter ID requirement if you actually have legally mandated processes in place to require the actual availability of a free ID, right, to the public, right, including members of marginalized communities, not like a technically free ID if you you pay $39 for a birth certificate or, or something like that, right? Having things like, you know, voter mobile, you know, uh, mobile stations going out to people who can't go to the DMV to get their, to get, to get their picture taken, th things like that, right? It, to the extent you want to make absentee balloting uh, more, more accessible, maybe send absentee ballot application forms to everybody instead of automatically sending the ballot itself if you don't even know the person is still at the address or that they want the ballot or that they haven't, you know, re-registered somewhere else. So I so I do agree, right? There's going to be a point eventually where you have to make trade-offs, but in many respects, I think we're kind of like our frankly our election system isn't good enough yet to have reached that point that we still have win-win uh, policies we can adopt where we're promoting multiple goals simultaneously. I think we might have time for a very brief last question. Um, Bob Wolf, I'm an appellate attorney here in Los Angeles. My question is, uh, the previous panel about norms talked about the problem with the, basically the electrical, the electoral college system where a few swing states could determine the outcome of a presidential election. My question is, I seem to remember some states where, um, I believe California signed on to it, the compact where they would award their electoral college votes to the winner of the national election, the leader. And if a majority of states with electoral votes agreed to that, that we then would have a de facto popular vote rather than electoral vote system. So two questions. One, has that just run out of steam? I haven't heard anybody ever talking about that recently. And the second question is whether the Electoral Count Act would affect the viability of that compact were a majority of the states to agree to it. Thanks. Great. Some very brief answers from anyone who would like. So, uh, so two things. I, I, the only states that have signed on to that compact, uh, assuming I'm right about, I think I'm right about this, are blue states. Number one. Number two. I'm very skeptical of the compact because, uh, at the moment at which it would actually make a difference, my fear is it would just fall apart, and you would have an even worse kind of crisis. So, uh, California, I believe, has signed the compact. So let's imagine, you know, in 2024, uh, the national vote goes for Donald Trump, but California has voted for the Democrat by millions of votes. Do you actually think the California legislature is going to keep that system intact? What will happen will be, you know, as we get closer to the election, and it looks like that's what's going to happen, they'll exit the compact. And it's not enforceable. So I think it's actually kind of dangerous because it could give the illusion that we have a rule for how we're going to settle this if you actually got bipartisan buy-in, but it would be very likely to come undone at the moment at which it mattered. Article 5 exists for a reason. Uh, and I think if you want to get rid of the Electoral College, you have to actually amend the Constitution. All right. We'll thank our, let's thank our terrific panelists.